Howdy folks, I'm Ben Starr, the ultimate food geek. Welcome back to my messy kitchen. Today I am going to demonstrate my method that I use two, sometimes three times a year for making homemade stock. Now having access to homemade stock can really up your game in terms of the quality of your home cooking. It makes it taste like it came out of a fine restaurant rather than out of a box, right? Now I'm not going to say that I never resort to using this stuff. I certainly have in the past. But making stock before you make soup is time consuming and making enough stock ahead of time to always have quarts and quarts of stock on hand at any given moment takes up too much storage space unless you're canning it and keeping it at room temperature but even that is just too much work for me. So what I do is I make gallons and gallons of stock at one time and then I reduce that down to a very concentrated paste and use that to re rehydrate into delicious, beautifully flavored, rich, homemade stock. So I'm going to show you how I do that today. Now, of course, there are millions of different ways to skin a cat, and I'm going to show you what I use in my stock. You certainly don't have to replicate all of that. But the secret to my stock, and indeed the secret to most uh, superior restaurant stocks, is actually chicken feet. Now, I know that's probably going to make a bunch of you squirm on the other side of the camera there, but chicken feet really do go an extraordinarily long way in producing an absolutely delicious, quality, rich, thick stock. If you have a favorite ramen restaurant in your town, guarantee you half of the product that goes into making that stock are chicken feet. And just because you've never actually seen these in the grocery store doesn't mean that your grocery store doesn't carry them. Ask the butcher if you don't see it in the aisle. Most ethnic markets absolutely carry these because they're a very important ingredient in many ethnic cuisines. So travel down to your local Mercado if you have trouble finding these and they're usually really cheap. I got this giant bag for six dollars and these are actually from pasture raised chickens from a very very fancy farm nearby. Now the most obvious source for bones for a chicken stock is leftover rotisserie chicken from the supermarket, right? Don't ever throw these away. You can toss them in a Ziploc bag, get those extra large bags, which will hold three, four, five of these carcasses. Keep them in the freezer as you accumulate them, and when you get enough, it's time to make stock. Now, a technique that I use a lot at home is roasting chickens whole, but I spatchcock them, which means to remove the spine, flatten that bird out so that it cooks quickly and evenly. I got plenty of videos on that technique as well. I save all of those spines as they come out along with the skin and the organs that are inside the cavity, throw them in the freezer, and when I've got enough of them, they also go into the stock. Another wonderful stock ingredient which you can find at many ethnic markets are the necks and backs of chickens and turkeys. These are parts that aren't typically included in a processed broken down bird, don't have much value to the everyday consumer, so these are typically sold at a really, really cheap price and they will make a fabulous stock. So the first thing that I do when making my stock is roast these bones to get a really nice golden deep sear on them. That contributes to a much more flavorful stock. You do not have to do this. Your bones, if they are raw, can go right into the pot. Or, you know, these bones are actually already cooked with the rotisserie chicken. They can actually go right into the pot. But roasting them gives an extra depth of flavor that definitely pays back dividends in your final dish. Another step that will increase the flavor and concentration of the stock is to break up the larger bones. This is part of a thigh bone, and if you've got a meat cleaver to just hack those open, you get access to all of that rich bone marrow in there that comes out and dissolves in the stock, makes it really delicious. The cleaver technique is also great with the feet. Your chicken and turkey necks don't really need to be cleaved because they're made up of tiny little bones that are really going to kind of dissolve into your stock anyway. It's only the larger bones and feet that you need to worry about hacking if you're going to do that. But something to keep in mind is that this hacking technique is a spectacular way to spread potential pathogenic bacteria all over your kitchen. This is the reason that I only do this two or maybe three times a year is because afterwards I have to go wipe down every surface in my kitchen with an antibacterial solution, either Lysol or some bleach diluted with water just to make sure I haven't sprayed salmonella all over a surface that I might cross infect from. So you definitely want to be cautious with your food safety and you don't even really have to do the hacking but it does make a noticeable difference in the final quality of your stock. Now I've got this lovely tray here of raw chicken parts and I am going to drizzle them with some oil and I have got my oven preheated to 475 degrees on convection roast. If you don't have convection, that's fine. Convection just helps it happen a little bit quicker. And I'm going to roast these until they are a deep golden brown. Now if you're using chicken feed and you've never worked with them before, this isn't going to smell like a nice chicken roasting in the oven. It's going to smell a little bit unusual, but you got to trust me, chicken feet make the best stock. All right, this is going into the oven. 
That was my raw chicken. I'm going to do a separate tray for the carcasses that have already been cooked. They won't need to roast quite as long. Hacking is a good idea for the larger bones like the leg, the thigh, and the wing bones because that'll let all that delicious marrow out into the stock. And the nice thing about hacking a cooked chicken is that you aren't potentially spraying pathogenic bacteria around your kitchen. This chicken should, in theory, have been pasteurized during the cooking process. While I'm hacking up these cooked chicken carcasses, I do want to say that occasionally I make stock on the spot after getting one of these store-bought rotisserie chickens. If we've picked it over really clean and that carcass is there, I might pull out my pressure cooker, my instant pot, and go ahead and just make stock that night, overnight, while I'm asleep. I can set the timer on it to let it go for three to four hours, and the next morning I wake up and the stock has cooled, and then I'll use it that week, right? So that's sort of like stock on demand. I'll plan my menu for the week so that I can utilize that stock in something later on during the week. You'll notice also that there are some significant portions of meat on a couple of these carcasses. Meat does contribute an important quality to stock. You don't have to sacrifice meat in stock because it's definitely good to eat, but if you don't think you're going to use that meat for the rest of the week, go ahead and just leave it on the carcass because because it's going to contribute to the richness of your stock. Now this is a truly giant tray full of chicken and turkey parts, but because they are already cooked, I'm not going to be super worried about making sure they get golden. If I was going to do that, I would do this in probably two to three different trays at a time. you also notice that I line these trays with parchment. That's not a purist thing to do. The purist would let the chicken kind of caramelize on the bottom of the pan and then gather all of that fond and return it to the stock, but I have got so much much meat and bone product here that my stock is going to be unbelievably rich. So I'm going to err on the side of easier cleanup than extra effort. All right, that's also going to go into the oven until golden brown. Now, aromatics. Classical technique would have you add the aromatics to the pot during the last hour of simmering because some of their aromatic quality goes away if you boil them for hours and hours and hours and hours. This is true, but because I make my stock in the pressure cooker, I am going to put everything in there at once. If you are just using a large pot, you can wait on these and add them during the last hour of simmering. One of the really nice things about stock is you don't have to peel your onions or garlic. You can just cut them in half, get them on the pan to roast. Now, if you're running out of room on the pan like I am, your celery, it really doesn't have to be roasted. The vegetables that get the most benefit from roasting are the carrots, onions, and garlic. These are also going to get some olive oil and go into a 475 degree oven until they've got some nice brown char on them. Now I know what you're thinking. There ain't no way he's got a pressure cooker big enough to hold all of that chicken and those vegetables. Well, actually, I do. I mean, I did co-own a fine dining restaurant for seven years. So I've got a lot of cool toys that not necessarily everybody has at their home. You do not have to have a pressure cooker to make this recipe. You can just use a cheap giant tamale steamer that you can get for 20 or 25 bucks at any Latin American market. The bigger pot, the better in terms of this recipe because you're gonna be able to make more stock and reduce it down and then you'll have enough stock for months and months and months and won't have to do this very frequently because it is a sizable project. Okay, our raw parts are done nice golden brown all over there. I'm just gonna transfer those here to the stock pot. And as you are moving your parts into the pot, really think about conserving space as much as possible. We've got a lot of stuff to fit into this pot. So I don't want there to be any huge air spaces. I want to kind of fit it in there, sort of like a puzzle, to make sure we are maximizing the space that we have. And now we've got our big plate of carcasses. And finally, we have our lovely roasted aromatics here. I do like for my onions to get a little bit darker than this, but the garlic was actually starting to burn, which can happen if you cook them together like I did. So I went ahead and pulled it before those got quite as dark as I normally like to. Now, if you're making this in a pressure cooker, remember, you never want to fill the pressure cooker more than about three quarters of the way full. You've got to have a little space for foaming so you don't clog up your weight. Now you're going to fill the pressure cooker to just above the level of all of your ingredients. Now, I'm a little bit weird and then I don't add herbs or spices to my stock. 
This is because I could be using this stock concentrate for anything from Thai food to Italian food. So I don't want to load this up on bay leaf and rosemary if this is going to end up being the base for a lovely Tom Kha Gai. Luckily, fresh or dried herbs are very easy to incorporate while you're cooking, and their aromas are so volatile that to add them to the stock right now would be sort of pointless. They would be cooked off by the time the stock is finished. Based on the number of quarts of water I was able to add to my pot, I know that I'm going to get more than four gallons of stock out of this batch, which is crate. And these aren't lightweight stocks like the kind of garbage you get at the grocery store. These are intensely concentrated stocks that we're going to concentrate even further in order to save space. So this is going to last me probably three to four months worth of cooking. And the final ingredient that I'm going to add is some vinegar. Really any kind of vinegar will work. I'm going to add about a cup for this giant thing of stock. The vinegar is going to acidify the stock as it cooks and that's going to help strip all of the gelatin out of those bones and make our stock extra extra rich absorbing all of that goodness. You do hear this term bone broth thrown around and there's actually no such thing as a bone broth. Stock is made from bones, broth is made from meat. So bone broth is a misnomer but it's a trendy thing right now to indicate a really concentrated stock made from bones. This is the most delicious and healthy and flavorful bone broth you could ever possibly make. All right, I am going to lock my pressure cooker and turn it on and once I reach pressure, I'm going to cook this much stock for three hours. Now if you're making this in just a giant open air pot that's not under pressure, I'm going to ask you to bring it to a rapid boil, then turn it down and simmer very gently just where you see some bubbles rising to the top for at least six hours up to eight hours. Now this is all going to happen while I'm sleeping and my induction burner is going to automatically turn itself off after three hours. That's going to give this big screaming hot pot of stock a little time to cool down to manageable temperatures for the next step tomorrow. And don't worry about food safety at this point. If you're thinking that this is going to sit at room temperature and breed bacteria after you've turned it off, we are going to be boiling this again for hours to concentrate it which will fully pasteurize it. So no need to be worried about this sitting out at room temperature as it cools overnight. Good morning. My stock has been slowly resting and cooling overnight. It smells unbelievable and it's time to go ahead and strain it. Now this process is a little bit annoying. You just have to pluck at it until you're done. There's of course many different ways to do it. You can use a strainer to scoop those things out, some tongs. I like to use a strainer and then keep a colander inside a bowl here to make sure I uh, rescue as much of that delicious liquid stock as possible. And also make sure you've got your garbage can handy really close by so you don't have to run across the room to get to it. And when you're not getting many more ingredients as you're fishing through that liquid, it's time to do the final strain. Now if you've got a couple of people, it might be easier for you to just do a lift and pour. But there's a lot of stock in here. This is a big old heavy pot. So you're going to need to get another pot that you think will hold enough stock or multiple pots. If you don't have a lot of big pots, you may be going through four or five of your biggest pots in your house. Simply ladle to strain. Now if you're doing this on your own like I am, it's going to take quite a while. Just be patient. It's meditative, sort of like yoga or knitting. Immediately, you can see the difference between commercially made chicken stock and our delicious homemade stock, right? This homemade stock is infinitely more concentrated than this garbage that you get at the grocery store. Golden brown broth my ass. This is golden brown broth. You are going to notice a layer of fat that floats at the top of your stock. Most classical stock making methods will tell you that you need to remove that fat layer either by skimming it, which is literally impossible to get it all off, or by refrigerating the entire pot of broth so that the fat layer solidifies and you can just rake it off the top. And that's a lot of extra work in an already involved process. I don't do that and no matter what anybody tells you, a little bit of animal fat is good for you. But if your doctor has ordered you to avoid all saturated fats, the best way for you to do that is to go ahead and refrigerate it until that top fat layer solidifies. But I'm also going to show you another trick at the end of the video on clarifying this stock so that it's crystal clear and that process will also remove the fat. So if you decide to do that method, you'll be removing the fat in that step. 
Now, we have got gallons of stock here, and to try to store this all in the refrigerator for future use or to can it would be a nightmare. This is why I like to reduce it to almost nothing. It will become an ultra concentrated paste that will take up very little space in the refrigerator, and then a small spoon of that will reconstitute into a lovely rich broth. So I've got my induction burner back out here. We're gonna bring this to a rapid boil. This process is gonna take several hours, but luckily you don't need to be around until it really starts to get close to the end. So bring it to a nice rapid boil and let it reduce. As this stock reduces closer and closer to the bottom of the pot, you're gonna notice several changes in it. First of all, it will begin to smell a little bit different, a little more toasty and brown. You'll also notice that the bubbles rise higher above the flat surface of the stock than it did when the entire thing was simmering. This is because we're getting rid of all of the water that's in the stock and we're down to the gelatin and the solids. Also, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when the majority of the water in the stock is being converted into steam. So if you have a nice instant read thermometer like this, you can take the temperature of your stock to know about how much water you've boiled out of it. My stock is sitting at 213 degrees Fahrenheit, so this tells us that the water content is definitely reducing in the stock and we're getting down more toward those gelatins and solids that have a much higher evaporation point. My stock's been reducing for about five hours now. I'm starting to really notice a smell change in the stock. And when I take its temperature, we are at 214 to 215 degrees. So I know I'm continuing to purge a significant amount of water from this stock. We are getting close to the point where we can go ahead and stop it. But for now, I'm gonna let it keep going. I'm gonna turn the temperature down just a little bit and then scrape the bottom just to make sure we're not getting any scorching because you can ruin your hard won stock at this point if it reduces to the point where it begins to scorch. Here in these last few minutes, as I'm stirring, I'm beginning to feel a little bit of texture on the bottom of the pot. To me, that means if I go much further than this, I'm gonna start burning my concentrate. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop at this point. I'm gonna give it 15 or 20 minutes to cool down and then we'll pour it into our storage containers. Don't wait too long to pour your reduced stock into a container because it will completely solidify. It is mostly gelatins and solids at this point. Now, if you're going to be storing in glass jars, be aware that you're pouring a very hot liquid into those jars. So you'll wanna maybe heat them up in some hot water or in your dishwasher before you pour this hot liquid into it or you might risk shattering the glass jars. But I'm just using these food grade plastic to go soup containers. Another benefit of using these plastic to go containers is that I can pretty quickly chill these down in an ice bath so that I can get them into the fridge as soon as possible. And I'm actually gonna redistribute this to give some headspace because one of these containers is gonna go into the freezer because this is gonna last me several months and you'll get more shelf life out of this concentrate if it's frozen. I wanna briefly cover the technique for clarifying your stock or making it crystal clear because as our stock is right now, it's not very clear, it's cloudy. Of course, it's cloudy with flavor and the clearer you make your stock, the more flavor you strip out of it. So I actually don't recommend doing this unless presentation is more important than flavor and there are very few times where that's the case. But the classical consomme or a crystal clear broth is occasionally something that you'll want to produce for a special occasion and I do have a birthday this week where I'm serving a really beautiful wonton soup and I want those handmade wontons to float in that nice crystal clear broth for a formal occasion. Now if you're not familiar with this technique it's going to look and sound super weird but it actually works. For every quart or liter of stock that you want to clarify, you're going to use two egg whites, a couple of teaspoons of water, half of a teaspoon of vinegar, any type, and the crushed up egg shells from the eggs. Super weird, right? This is actually going to create a natural filter that our stock is going to flow through. It's gonna capture all those solid particles that are keeping the stock from being clear. So as you warm up your stock and it gets about body temperature or slightly around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you're gonna pour these ingredients into the stock. Give it a nice stir and then continue to heat over medium to medium high heat, and you'll start to notice an unusual transition take place the warmer the stock gets. 
as the mixture heats, give a gentle stir every now and then, scraping securely and firmly along the bottom of the pot, just to make sure you're not scorching any of those egg whites or shells. But don't stir vigorously because these whites are coming together to create a filter for our stock and we don't want to break them up too much. When your stock comes to a simmer, reduce the heat and maintain that simmer for about five minutes. You don't want a rolling boil, just a nice simmer. That stock is sending up all those impurities through the top of that raft and it's filtering it out. So you want that to happen nice and gently. 20 minutes later and our egg filter has definitely solidified and you can see from the stock floating on top of it that we've achieved pretty significant clarification. Now what we want to do is very gently remove the majority of the egg raft with a slotted spoon. And you want to be as gentle as possible while you do this because you don't want to break that egg raft up into smaller pieces that will go back and make your stock cloudy again, right? So, easy does it, nice and slow as you're removing these. At the end, we'll be able to dump the rest of this raft and filter out any extra consomme so that we don't lose a drop. Once the majority of the egg filter is removed, you can gently ladle the stock through some cheesecloth, or in this case, I'm just using a damp flour sack towel. I use these all around my kitchen. They have a lot of really great uses. You can even use an old t-shirt if you don't have anything better around. And again, the key here is nice, gentle movements because you don't want to break that raft up any more than you have to into tiny particles that will make our stock cloudy again. When you start to accumulate a decent amount of egg white in that filter, you can rinse out the flour sack towel and start over. Now this method is actually going to filter out the majority of the fat that was left in your stock. But if you absolutely can't have any of that delicate fat floating on top, which does add richness and flavor, but it does detract from the clarity of the stock. Just refrigerate it overnight after this, and then you'll be able to skim that coagulated fat off of the top of your stock. When you get down to a point where it's feasible for you to do so safely, you can delicately pour the rest of that stock through the filter. And there we have it, our beautifully clarified stock. The difference is pretty stark, right? Now, as I mentioned before, when you remove the solids from the stock, you also sacrifice flavor. I'm actually going to do a direct taste test, and I've never done this before. There's noticeably less flavor, but it's not so much that I think it ruins all of the hard effort that we put into it. I might actually do this technique a little bit more often. It certainly produces a more beautiful end result. Now the FDA would like for you to rapidly cool your stock or your stock concentrate down below 40 degrees Fahrenheit and then immediately put it in the refrigerator or the freezer. That is because the longer food stays in this danger zone between 40 Fahrenheit and 140 Fahrenheit, you can get a logarithmic bloom of bacteria so that these unsafe food pathogens can go absolutely crazy and multiply in that danger zone. As long as you're below 40 Fahrenheit or above 140 Fahrenheit, you're usually pretty safe. Now that is actually easier said than done, especially when you're working with glass containers and a large volume of stock that you need to cool down quickly. You can easily shatter a glass container by lowering a super hot glass container into an ice water bath. If you're working with small amounts of stock in plastic containers, of course, it's pretty simple to rig up a little ice bath. But here's the deal. Virtually every application that you're going to be using this stock concentrate in, it's going to be heated to the boiling point, whether you're making a sauce or enriching a soup or a casserole. So you don't have to be super panicky about food safety as long as you know this is eventually going to be boiled, which will repasteurize it and kill any bacteria that happen to have multiplied. What you must absolutely avoid is putting a large container of hot stock like this directly into your refrigerator or freezer because your refrigerator can't keep up with all of that thermal mass and that heat is going to warm up everything in your refrigerator, potentially exposing all of that stuff to temperatures that are unsafe. So let this cool on the countertop until it's room temperature, then it can go into the refrigerator or freezer to cool all the way back down to food safe temperatures. Now let's take a look at our stock concentrate here. 
just in the time that I have chilled it down to about room temperature in this ice bath, it has already completely solidified. That's because of the extraordinarily high gelatin content that we extracted from the bones. By the time this is chilled down to refrigerator temperatures, it's actually going to be a little bit hard to get our spoon into it. It will be so solid. It's pretty extraordinary. Now, a tablespoon or two of this delicious stuff in just a couple of quarts of plain old tap water is going to give you an extraordinarily rich, deeply flavored stock that'll just beat the pants off of anything you could ever possibly get off the shelf at the supermarket. And we reduced our storage footprint from four gallons, that's 16 of these guys, all the way down to this. <laughs> like I can stack right up on top of each other and take up virtually no space in your refrigerator or freezer. It's a wonderful method for you to be able to make your own rich, nourishing, flavorful homemade stock and be able to access it for months at a time without taking up crazy amounts of space or having to make homemade stock each time you want to serve something that has homemade stock as an ingredient. I hope you've enjoyed this tiny little peek into how I make foods coming out of my humble little kitchen taste like they came out of the fine dining restaurant that I cooked in for seven years. I'm Ben Starr, the ultimate food geek. Hit me up on my website, benstar.com, and subscribe to my YouTube feed for more awesome cooking stuff. Thanks for watching.